this morning. Uh, I want to talk to you this morning about the rapture and a little bit about the thousand-year reign of Christ. Uh, this morning's lesson is really a continuation of last Sunday's where we talked a little bit about the mark of the beast and the last days. And one of the main points we made is, is that that last days has been going on ever since Jesus resurrected and ascended back to his Father. We've been in the last days for a long time. And, and so we tried to answer some questions about the mark of the beast last week, and I want to kind of address the concepts of the rapture and this thousand-year reign of Christ that, that you hear a lot about. Uh, have, you, have you seen the bumper sticker or heard the slogan, you know, in case of the rapture, this car will be unmanned? Um, it, it just, all of this relates together with the last days, premillennialism, um, all of this fits together. The book of Revelation is a hot spot for end times and talks of a thousand-year reign. And any discussion of a thousand-year reign brings up the word or concept of a millennium. And that's just a reference to a thousand-year time period. And there are, there are differing views about the thousand-year, quote-unquote, reign of Christ. The most common ones are premillennium, postmillennium, or ah millennium. And, and the prefixes there kind of determine what the belief is. Postmillennialism believes that Jesus will return after a thousand-year reign. Uh, Premillennialism believes Jesus will return and this rapture will take place before a thousand-year reign. And amillennialism believes that basically that thousand-year reign is spiritual, it's figurative, not literal, and just for your sakes at the outset of this, I'm more in that amillennial camp. Premillennialism is probably the most popular. It states that we are living now in a time before a literal thousand-year reign of Christ, hence pre-millennial, and they believe a rapture will take place before that millennium. Here's the basic premise of, of premillennialism. Jesus came to establish his kingdom, but because the world was too wicked to accept him as their king, he was crucified instead. And so instead of setting up the kingdom that God planned, God then enacted plan B, which was the church. A temporary solution until he returns again. When Jesus does come back again, they say, a rapture will occur at this second coming when all the saints, the faithful only, will be caught up together with the Lord. This will be followed by seven years of tribulation caused by the Antichrist who will be defeated in a literal battle of Armageddon 
when Christ puts an end to evil, then he will set up his kingdom that he meant to and reign for a thousand years on earth, literally in Jerusalem, literally followed by the judgment. Now, there are varying flavors of that. Um, but, but I just want to give you today my main objections with this idea. And then we'll close a little bit talking about the rapture. Here's my main problem with those who believe in this premillennialism, literal reign of Christ on this earth, thousand-year reign rapture. My biggest issue with this is, number one, that God failed. And that the church that we are now a part of, the glorious church, was plan B. Rather than the church being in the mind of God, the apple of his eye, his prophesied plan and promise, it's plan B. It's the default that God went to when his original plan didn't work out. The Jews' rejection of Jesus was not God's plan, they say. My main issue with that biblically is that's... A, this is exactly what God said would happen. It's prophesied that Jesus would be rejected. Psalm 118 and verse 22 talks about the stone which the builders rejected would become the chief cornerstone. That's quoted by Jesus in Matthew 21 after talking about a vineyard and some vine growers killing the landowner's son. He quotes Psalm 18 to reference himself. Peter, in 1 Peter 2, quotes Psalm 18 about the, the stone which the builders rejected becoming the chief cornerstone. That's just one example. We're not, we haven't even talked about the prophesi prophecies of Jesus being crucified, prophesied that Jesus would be crucified, rejected, Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. Jesus being rejected didn't catch God by surprise. It was his plan all along. Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Or how about Acts chapter 2 when they're preaching the first gospel sermon about the death of Christ. They say in verse 23, Paul, Peter does, This man, speaking of Jesus, was delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. This wasn't a surprise to God. God didn't fail. This was his plan, that godless men would nail him to the cross, and in so doing, he would provide the salvation that God planned all along. Listen to Ephesians 3, 8 through 11, about the church and about Jesus and this eternal plan. Paul says, to me, the very least of all saints, the grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. What is that ministry? What that mystery, it's that Gentiles would be included. Listen to verse 10. So that the manifold wisdom of God may, might now be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance, listen to it, with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church bringing together of Jews and Gentiles was God's eternal purpose. Ephesians 1 and verse 4 says, we have been chosen in him from the foundation of the world. So that's my major issue with premillennialism and this rapture is that, 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 that Jesus being rejected was not the plan, that the church was not God's plan. A second monster problem that, that relates to this is the idea that, that God could fail. The idea that God's plan, his original plan of bringing his kingdom didn't work out, like God couldn't foresee or couldn't control or have power over history or humanity. Their idea is that God had a plan and his plan didn't work out. That doesn't bother you. If God didn't set up his kingdom the first time that Jesus came because the Jews rejected him because they're what he, they weren't ready, what's to stop that from happening again? I believe Jesus already set up his kingdom. I believe that kingdom is seen in the church that you and I are part of today. I believe we are living in what the thousand years of Revelation was talking about. We've been in the last days 
Jesus has been reigning as king in his kingdom ever since he ascended to the right hand of his father. He is now king of kings, lord of lords on his throne. Folks who are waiting for Jesus to set up his kingdom, who think the church was not the kingdom being referred to, I want to give you a couple passages. Jesus said the kingdom would come while some of those he was speaking to then were still living. Mark 9 and verse 1, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there are some of those who are standing here who shall not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Luke 22 and verse 30 Jesus told his disciples they would eat and drink at his table in his kingdom. That kingdom came with power in Acts chapter 1. When the promised Holy Spirit baptism fell on the disciples and the apostles and they preached the gospel and they used the keys of the kingdom that they were promised to open its gates to all who would hear. Every prophecy of the kingdom says... It would come during the days of the Roman Empire. Daniel chapter 2 talks about this specifically. When Nebuchadnezzar sees the great statue and Babylon is that head of gold and the Medo-Persians are the silver and the Greeks were the bronze and the Romans are the iron and clay mixed together. Why do we know that? Because that's how the world events and empires played out in history. During the days of the fourth kingdom, Jesus or Daniel prophesied a small stone would strike the rock and fill the world. Listen to Daniel 2, 44. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. And that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. The church is the fulfillment of the kingdom that was coming. It was the manifold wisdom of God. It was his plan all along for Jesus to build what he called my church, his church, and the gates of Hades would not prevail against it. And the apostles were given the keys to that kingdom and they opened its doors beginning in Acts 2. This is the last days. This is the coming of the kingdom. Look, if even one prophecy of God fails, who's to say they can't all fail? If God can fail one time, who's to say that he can't fail again? Daniel gave us the time. The people of Jesus' day knew it was the time. False messiahs arose because they understood it was the time. I just, I would wholeheartedly reject any concept that says my God could fail, my God doesn't know the future, and that the church would be some kind of plan B. Jesus is now reigning as king of his kingdom. So let's then talk quickly about this concept of rapture. The word rapture is not even found in Scripture, but some would suggest that the concept is. Let's talk about that. What does the Bible say about when Jesus comes? What does it say it's going to happen when Jesus comes again? Is there a rapture of righteous only? Um, is there a literal thousand-year reign and then possibly another resurrection or rapture after that? I believe the Bible shows that when Jesus comes again, when the day of the Lord comes, his final coming, that's it. It's the end. He's not coming a third time. When Jesus comes again, the, the next coming, that's it. 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 13. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth will and its works will be burned up. Since all these things are to be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought you to be? I think the implication is now in holy conduct and godliness, talking to them, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intensity. But, but according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. See, premillennialism suggests there will be first a rapture, a resurrection of the faithful only, and then a thousand-year reign on earth, and then Jesus reigning literally on earth in Jerusalem. Look, 2 Peter says when the Lord comes again, I don't think any of us want to be here. 
The heavens will melt with an intense heat. The earth and its works are burned up. This is the last day. The last, last day. Not the last days that we've been in since Jesus ascended. This is the last day, day of the Lord. And when Jesus comes and the door of his tent is closed, that's it, Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. Jesus isn't coming again a third time. Once he comes back, that's it. Then begins the new heavens and new earth, and this one has been done away with. Another popular uh, rapture passage is Luke 17, 35 and following, where it talks about women grinding together and one taken and one left. I want to talk about that really. Look at verse 33 of Luke 17. Whoever seeks to keep his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life will preserve it. I tell you, on that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken, another will be left. There will be two women grinding at the same place. One will be taken and the other one will be left. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other will be left. First of all, I believe this is a reference to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. But even if it's not, note verse 36. Left where? One's taken is one left. Left where, the disciples ask. And answering, they said to him, Where, Lord? And he said that to them, where the body is, there also the vultures will be gathered. The ones left are left for the vultures. It's death. It's destruction. It doesn't sound like living another a thousand years. Another key rapture passage is 1 Thessalonians 4. And it speaks of those being caught up together with the Lord in the air. Listen to it. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Powerful scripture. So full of hope. Answering a question that they specifically have. If you'll read the whole chapter. They were worried. What about the saints who have already died? These words were written to comfort them that, look, dead saints are going to rise as well. And it seems that this resurrection of the, of the dead and the living all happens at once. And we see that in Revelation, the souls of those martyred for Christ's sake before their throne. The dead in Christ get taken care of. But what's interesting is what does the very next verse and next chapter talk about in 1 Thessalonians 5? What does all this rapture connected with it's connected to the day of the lord the day that he says in chapter 5 verse 2 and 3 is going to come like a thief while people are saying peace and safety destruction will come upon them suddenly think first peter 3 think the earth and its works burned up when jesus comes when this rapture happens that's it it's all over i believe it's if we're going to use the word rapture which i have a little bit of an issue with because scripture doesn't it's everybody at one time. It is, to me, the general resurrection of all people. Let me just kind of give you a couple kind of closing thoughts here, I guess. Every study of the Lord's coming that I've done, when Jesus comes, there's, there's at least three things that happen. One, death is defeated right then. Second, creation, this earth... Our world is set free from its bondage and corruption. Romans 8 talks about this in detail. Listen to 19 through 23 of Romans 8. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation, talking about this earth, this world, was subjected to futility. I think this is going all the way back to when Adam sinned, the world changed. It was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself would be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now, and not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. We're all looking forward to that resurrection. The creation here, he says, is looking forward to our resurrection. And when the Lord comes, when this earth is set free from its utility, 
All of this happens together. The earth being set free and the redemption of our bodies, the resurrection, it all happens. The becoming of the new heavens and new earth, that follows immediately after his coming. There's no concept of a literal reign here. Every state of the Lord's coming. Death is defeated right then. Creation is set free. And number three, every opportunity to accept Christ as Savior after his coming is terminated. There are, no, there are no other opportunities. Again, 2 Peter 3, when the day of the Lord comes, heaven and earth pass away. When Jesus comes, that's it with this old creation. Matthew 25, 31 through 46, when Jesus comes in all of his glory, he says all nations are gathered together and they get separated. Premillennialism believe that the judgment happens when Christ comes, but, but that's not... That's not the great white throne judgment of Revelation 20. They say that doesn't happen until after this thousand year reign. The problem is in Matthew 25, you've got sheep and goats being separated and you've got goats going to a lake of fire. There's no idea of them getting a second chance. There's no idea of the, a, a thousand year reign here with Christ. They are getting sent to the lake of fire when he comes. I don't see any room for this thousand year gap. Before we close, can we quickly look at Revelation 20, where all this thousand-year reign comes from? One author said that if Revelation 20, 4 through 6, were never written, there'd never be a concept of a literal thousand-year reign or the picture of the rapture uh, that, that you most commonly see. Listen to Revelation 20, 1 through 6. And I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw them into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. All these things he after these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years was completed. This is the first resurrection Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, that, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. First of all, did you notice in verse 4, there's no mention of a thousand year reign of Christ? It's not Christ reigning. It's the saints reigning with Christ. That is the focus. This whole book has been about giving comfort to those who are being persecuted, then the, the souls of the martyrs are crying out, Lord, how long are you going to let this happen? And what you're seeing, the message of the book is God sees them, God takes care of them, God rewards them. So, uh, several other things that are missing from Revelation 20, if we're going to make this the final coming of Christ and literal. A second coming of Christ is not mentioned here. Reigning on earth is not mentioned here. Bodily resurrection is not mentioned here. In fact, Christ on earth is never mentioned. There is not in Scripture, I don't believe anywhere found, where Christ is setting foot on the earth again. The idea of a literal reign in Jerusalem really comes about because people don't understand that the land promise has already been fulfilled and people making the same mistake that, that, that the Jews of the first century made, trying to make the kingdom something literal, something material on earth. Jesus said, my kingdom's not of this world. Jesus said, this kingdom is within you. There's not even a mention of us. It's they, it's them. This is about them and their day, things soon to take place. They, the souls beheaded for their faith, they are reigning with Christ now already. And verse 5, it says, The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. The first resurrection is not a literal one. It's a picture of triumph. Ray Summers says this, What did John see in the scene that had to do with saints reigning with Christ a thousand years? He saw the triumph and reward of martyrs who had died. The thousand year period is not to be taken literally. This is a picture of those who, uh, who had then been martyred. Only by twisting the scriptures can the symbols here be made to fit anyone else. 
This was a message to assure them of the fate of their loved ones who had fallen. This is the first resurrection. The triumph of the martyrs is called the first resurrection. The second one is not mentioned, but must be the general resurrection discussed so often elsewhere in Scripture. The first death which is not mentioned but implied, must be physical death. The second death, which is mentioned here, is symbolic of eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. The martyrs who are pictured triumphant here are blessed because they have passed the first death, physical. And the second death, eternal separation from God, has no jurisdiction over them. They are victorious with the Christ for whom they died. They died, not us. This was written for them about things soon to take place. These folks were reigning now. They are rewarded now. And, and the second resurrection is, is still the general one that we're all waiting for. I think a key thing that premillennialism fail, fails to see is that we are all reigning with Christ now as kings and priests. We're not having to wait. It's not just something future. Now, there is a now and not yet. We're not fully reigning you know, with him yet. But partially, in a sense, we already are. Jesus is on his throne now. He is reigning now. He was raised from the dead. If anything, I believe we are currently in a figurative millennium. The last thing I'll say before I kind of let you go here. The book of Revelation is highly figurative. That's the genre it was written in. And it is a mistake to make literal things that are, are obviously figurative. Do you think Satan's chain is literal from this chapter? The thousand years, that's not only used in Revelation, and everywhere else it's always figurative. For example, in Psalm 50 and verse 10, God said, the cattle of a thousand hills are mine. He just means all of them, not literally a thousand. Ecclesiastes 7.28, one man among a thousand have I found. It's a reference to, to, to all men. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 talks about God keeps covenant for a thousand generations. Only a thousand or is he just talking about all? Psalm 84 and verse 10, one day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. 2 Peter 3 and verse 8, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. It's a symbolic number. It just suggests a long period of time or a large amount. The point of this passage of Revelation 20 the point of all of Scripture is that Christ is reigning as King of kings and Lord of lords. I don't need a literal reign of Christ on this earth. Again, I don't see a mention of him coming to earth again. He's already reigning in the true heavens, not a copy of the ones here on earth Hebrew writer talks about. He's in the true heavens. And we are called to meet him there, not him coming here. We're going to meet him the point of the book of Revelation is it's really not about the reign of Christ so much as is that martyred saints are reigning with him as their king. They are victorious. God has seen them. God has rewarded them. And they will forever reign with him. And so can you and I if we'll be faithful like they were, faith, they were faithful. Look, I, I know, again, we're only scratching the hem of the garment. There's so many other passages we could talk about. I'm not trying to give the definitive answer to all of these questions. I'm just trying to give you enough of a sample of not buying into the hysteria and not being led astray um, by not seeing these, these pictures correctly. We will rise to meet the Lord in the air if we're still alive. I believe 1 Thessalonians 4 is true, and I think it's powerful. But even if we fall asleep or we die before that time, we're going to rise too. God takes care of his faithful. That is the picture of Scripture. Look, I don't have all the answers on the end time. I don't. But what I know with absolute certainty, because God told me so in his Scripture, is if I'll be faithful to him, I will receive a crown of righteousness and I will dwell with him forever. I can be made cleansed and holy through the blood of Jesus Christ. I can become his child by being washed in the blood, which is pictured in the act of baptism. 
I can be his child. I can reign forever. Heaven can be my home forever if I'll be faithful. That's the message I want you to grab a hold of today. And that's the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Be blessed today. I heard an old, old story How the Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sins And won the victory Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He punched me to victory. At this time, let's partake of the Lord's Supper by offering, uh, to start with, a prayer for, for the bread. Heavenly Father, we are amazed at your power and your plan. And it's hard to fathom that killing your son was the remedy. But that's the one that you knew would be the one that could touch our hearts and minds. That your son, you offering him and, and sending him to take on flesh and allowing him to be tortured and killed, that could atone for our sins. That could give us forgiveness. And Lord, that is a powerful thought that is on my mind and hopefully on all of our minds as we partake of these emblems that represent what you've done for us in Jesus Christ. And so at this time, we are thankful for this bread that represents him coming in the flesh and his body that died on the cross for us. Thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's continue with a prayer of thanks for the cup, through the vine. Thank you, Lord, again for Jesus. Thank you for sending him. Thank you for your plan. Thank you, Jesus, for your willingness to endure crucifixion and all that you endured by taking on flesh. We are thankful for the blood that you shed that can make us cleansed and holy and forgiven. Thank you, Jesus. And it's in your name that we pray. I've heard about a mansion he has built for me in glory, and I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story, and some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory! 
should know who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God. There is a God.